the catenary cable. Okay, so uh, this is just a cable, and I can't really hang it from, from the top, but you can see maybe what's going on here. The key thing here is that what happens if I have a chain that or rope that has mass? I can't, if I pull from the ends, it's going to sag a little bit. And so the question is, what's the, what's the equation for that path that the, that the cable makes? This is a tough problem. And there are some tricks. And I don't like the tricks, but we're going to do them anyway because really there's no option. So let's just take, let's start off with this part of the cable. I'm taking a half. And I'm going to break this into a section of length S. And so this cable has uh, a linear mass density of lambda. And that's the mass per length. Uh, so if that's the case, then what this section of the cable is in equilibrium. So the net force on this section is zero. So that means that I actually have three forces on this piece of the cable. I have the tension pulling here. I'll call that T1. I have the tension on this side. I'll call that T2. And then I have the gravitational force Mg. And if that is in equilibrium, then these forces have to add up to zero. And if I call this the x direction and that the y direction, then the sum of the forces in the x direction is zero, the sum of the forces in the y direction is zero. So the first thing is, uh, let's say this angle is theta. And I picked this point because everyone else did it. And uh, this means that I have one of these forces in just the x direction and one of the forces in the x and the y direction. So let's write down F net x f net in the x direction is zero. So what are those forces? Well, I have this part right here. So let me draw that. There's T2. There's T2x, T2y, T2x, and that's the angle theta. So this is the adjacent side. So this is going to be equal to T2 magnitude times the cosine theta. And then I have this other force over here, minus T1 equals zero. Now the other in the y direction, I have F net y. And that's going to be equal to T2 sine theta, because that's the, the vertical component, T2 sine theta minus mg. mg is in the y direction. So I have two equations uh, right there. And let me just uh, do a little out. I'm going to add T1 to this side and get uh, mg to the other side. So I get T2 cosine theta equals T1 and T2 sine theta equals mg. Now let me take this divided by that. I'm going to take this equation divided by that equation. So I'm going to divide this side by that. So I get T2 sine theta over T2 cosine theta equals this mg over T1. And technically, mg, the mass of this would be lambda, the linear density, times the length s times g over t1. But you'll notice here on this side, the t2s cancel. And I have sine over cosine. So this means I get tangent theta is going to be equal to lambda g over t1 times s. Now. There is a relationship with theta, right? Because if I look up here, this tension, T2, is tangent to the curve. So that means that the direction of T2 is the same as the slope of the line right here. So tangent theta is actually going to be the slope, which is the derivative of y with respect to x. right? Because if I draw that as a picture, I have this. This is dy dx, and that's theta. So tangent theta is dy dx. Not just, and so that I can replace that. Now get rid of the theta in that case. Uh, another thing I'm going to do is this stuff right here is a constant. So I'm going to say k equals lambda g over t1. You don't have to do that. It's not super important, but it does help. So that means I get 
dy dx, which was my tangent theta, is equal to k times s. Now, if I could get an expression for ds, because this is this only works really because I'm I'm cheating here, right? Because my cable I drew my cable really long, but I I want to take the limit as this gets really small. So I want that way I don't have to worry about this piece being way over here and that piece being over there and where's all these weird things that can happen. So I want to get an expression for ds. So here's a trick. I'm going to take this and I'm going to take the derivative of this with respect to x on both sides. So if I take the derivative of y with respect to x and I take the derivative of that with respect to x again, I get the second derivative. So d, the second derivative of y with respect to x is going to be equal to k times the derivative of s with respect to x. Now, if I go back up here to this, this length is ds. So using the Pythagorean theorem, I get ds is equal to the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. That's straight from this. Now I want to, uh, so let's just write that out. I'm going to switch to a new piece of paper. Okay, so here I have, this is where we're at. We're at uh, the derivative the ds, d, the second derivative of y with respect to x is equal to k ds dx, but ds is the square root of dx squared plus dy squared, and all that's over dx. So now I want to get rid of this on the bottom, so I can multiply the top and bottom by 1 over dx, 1 over dx, and that cancels. Now, in order to bring this into the square root, it'd be 1 over dx squared. So this is going to be k times the square root of dx squared over dx squared plus dy squared over dx squared. So this is going to be equal to k times the square root of 1. Now, notice this is not the second derivative of y. This is the derivative of y with respect to x squared. See the difference? So I'll say plus dy dx, I'll put parentheses squared. Okay, so let's write down what we have. We have the second derivative of y with respect to x is going to be k times the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared. Now, this Let's just think about what this says. It says I take the derivative of dy dx and that's equal to something times dy dx. So one way to solve this is to let a variable z equals dy dx. So if that's the case, I have this. The derivative with respect to x of z equals k, and that is a trick, times the square root of 1 plus z squared. Okay, I want to get this uh, into separating the z's on one side and the x's on the other side. So if I cross multiply, if I multiply both sides by dx, and then I divide both sides by uh, 1, this, I divide 1 plus z, one, the square root of 1 plus z squared, then I get on this side, I have dz, oh, I got to do that to this side too. So on this side, I have the dx is canceled. I get dz divided by the square root of 1 plus z squared. And that's going to be equal to k times dx. Now I have, on the left, I only have z's. And on the right, I only have x. So I can integrate both sides. So this side's pretty easy. It's going to be k x plus some constant. But what about this integral? This one is not trivial. I mean, it's not one that I memorized, but you can look it up in a table. And uh, the integral of dz over the square root of 1 plus z squared is going to be hyperbolic sine of z. So this is going to be cinch, uh, inverse cinch of z. And that's going to be equal to kx plus c. So I only need one constant because uh, this would have a plus constant, but you can just add that to the other side and call it one constant altogether. Uh, now, furthermore, if, if I go back over here 
and I say this is at x equals zero right here, uh, then the derivative of the of z is the slope. Z is dy dx. That's also zero. So x of zero, then z is equal to zero, and the hyperbolic sine of zero is zero. Inverse hyperbolic of sine of zero. So this means that c is going to be equal to zero. I know that's a little bit hand wavy, but trust me, that's okay. Okay, so now I can go back over here and I can say uh, z equals dy dx. Uh, but and before I do that, actually, let me solve for z. So if I take the sine, the hyperbolic sine of both sides, I say, let's just write that out, cinch, and then cinch. Then this is just going to be z, and this is going to be the hyperbolic sine of kx. And see, that's where it's really nice to get rid of that c, otherwise it'd make things really complicated in here. Now I can substitute back in for z. I can say z is dy dx and that's going to be the hyperbolic sine of kx. Okay, what do we do now? Well, again, we want to get this into uh, separated variables. So I can multiply both sides by dx, and I get dy equals cinch kx dx. And yes, I can integrate both sides. Now that side is going to be really easy. The integral of dy is this y, and the integral of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine. They, that One of the nice things about hyper, hyperbolic sines is they act like uh, normal sines, right? So this means I get y equals, I gotta take the, I gotta take into account this kx. So I get one over k hyperbolic cosine kx plus c, another c. And really this, I'm going to stop here because this is my solution. This is the uh, equation of a, of a catenary cable. It uh, deals with this uh, hyperbolic cosine. Now, what, what's k and what's c? That depends on your parameters. Uh, so, but, but this just shows you that the function of a catenary cable is a hyperbolic uh, trigonometry function hyperbolic cosine. And, and that, that's, where you, that's where you get it. Um, I, I will say, solving for k, finding k based on, if I know like where these two points are and I know the length of the cable and I wanna find that curve, so here's P1, here's P2, and then has the total length L, it's not trivial, okay? It's still really hard to get from here to get to the actual plotting of that. Uh, but that's how you find the expression for a catenary cable.